It's taking a while. Okay, well, here we go. All right, guys, uh, welcome once again to the worship ministry class. Uh, glad you could join. Uh, well, let's get started. Uh, we'll pray and uh, we'll get started. Yeah, Father, we submit this time into your hands. We thank you for another beautiful day. Uh, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness that sustains us day after day, God. How beautiful are you? What a privilege it is to uh, know you, to learn about you, to serve you, God, and your church. I pray that you would uh, lead us, guide us, and help us to be sensitive, help me to be sensitive uh, to your voice. Continue to pour out your wisdom over us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, well, glad you could all join. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, and if you're in Bangalore, I hope you are okay and healthy because <laughs> the weather is a little bit crazy. But otherwise, all good. All good. Great. So uh, let's do a quick recap of what we've covered in the previous class. Right? We uh, started off, uh, remember, we're, this chapter is all about learning worship ministry in the Bible, how people in the Old Testament uh, organized themselves or approached uh, this uh, um, this aspect of worship right? that we are talking about. So we started off by talking about the altars of Abraham, how Abraham is known for a lot of, uh, he's got a lot of other titles uh, you know, associated with his name. Uh, but then we also learned that how he was a man of altars. He was obedient, right? He walked by faith. Um, so we saw about the four altars that he built and how his walk with every altar that he built uh, progressed in his intimacy you know, with God. Right? With every altar that he built, uh, he was saying yes to God and no to himself, uh, so to say. Um, right? And so we finally we finished with this fourth altar, the altar of sacrifice. And in conclusion, uh, we saw that God is not only asking us to build altars, but uh, He's asking us to uh, be on the altar, as we concluded uh, seeing in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, offer ourselves up as living sacrifices. Right, So we are called to be men and women of altars, but also to offer ourselves up as a living sacrifice, which is, uh, which is also uh, an act of worship. Right, So uh, that's where we stopped. Um, but let's continue from where we left off um, in, in the notes from page eight. Uh, we want to just go a little bit more deeper into how the worship ministry was organized in the Old Testament, right? Um, so like, the note says the Old Testament does not give us an exact blueprint of the worship of ancient Israel, uh, right? However, it contains some important principles that can help us in structuring our worship right so uh, 5,000 years later 6,000 years later whatever uh, the methods have changed the methods have evolved right from the early church from from the time of Abraham to Moses uh, to the New Testament until now um, the methods of how we express our worship has changed but the principle remain the same and that's what we're trying to uh, get into our hearts uh, right so very briefly uh, after when the people of Israel after they was they were freed from Egypt uh, God gave them a set of laws commandment we all know that I started off with 10 and then it went all the way up to 613 with Moses's law and whatnot right so um, all of it is important, right? With Deuteronomy 6.13 says, You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. Um, and so the Egyptians, uh, sorry, the people of Israel, they were not set free for the sake of being set free. Okay, if you see Exodus chapter 8, verse 1, uh, God tells Moses to go and tell Pharaoh uh, to let my people go so they may come out and worship me, right? Um, so it was very important uh, in the Old Testament. It's, it's always been important. It's not like we, uh, uh, it, it's not like that it was never important, 
uh, it's always been important this uh, worship ministry in the bible um, right so we we will not study in detail about the tabernacle of moses uh, in this section however we will do that in the following sections to come as in just to understand this a little bit more and i'm sure you've already learned about all of this in the old testament survey in your first year okay but uh, so let's just briefly see how worship was organized in solomon's temple in david's tabernacle uh, as well uh, and with by reading a couple of scriptures is that yeah is that okay can we read a few scriptures as we go on All right, so um, after its construction by Solomon in 1000 BC, uh, the temple in Jerusalem became the prominent focus of Jewish worship, right? Uh, God gives David the blueprint of how to build the temple. Uh, it, is, uh, it is the Solomon who ends up building it, right? Uh, it appears that the emphasis of worship in that temple was primarily on sacrificial offerings and praise to God through music okay sacrificial offerings and praise to go through music so these were the two key uh focus uh in the temple that was built by solomon okay um let's uh in your notes uh, if we can we go we look at second samuel chapter 6 verse 5 second samuel chapter 6 verse 5 it says as the Ark of the Covenant was being brought to Jerusalem, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. Okay. Um, so just very quick pause here. Okay. So this is for the first time they're bringing the Ark back, uh, you know, the nation of Israel, uh, if in First Samuel chapter four, when you read that, you see that uh, the Philistines had taken the ark away, uh, and we know what we know the story of what happens. And for about seventy odd years, the ark of the covenant was not in Jerusalem. And when David becomes king, this is the first thing. The first thing what he does is he brings the ark of the covenant back into the nation of Israel, right? Now, from the time of Moses, when the tabernacle was erected, so after the book of Exodus, we have Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua brings the people of Israel into the promised land, and then we have the book of Judges and whatnot. Now, between the book of Joshua and Judges, somewhere, people forgot about the tabernacle after they moved into the promised land. And so when you read the book of Judges, you will see that people are going back uh, into uh, the ways of building altars again. Okay, so uh, you would read about that. But one of the things, what was very uh, prominent or uh, primary focus in the tabernacle of Moses was only sacrificial offerings, right? However, now in, for in David time, when he begins, uh, when after he brings the ark back and he erects his tabernacle again, which we will learn about it in, in the later chapter, uh, we see that sacrifice. He blends the mix of you know sacrificial offerings uh, and musical instruments, singing praise and worship and whatnot, because he was a worshiper. He was a musician. Um, right. So that's what's happening here in Second Samuel six five is that they worshipped, celebrating. Uh, before the Lord, uh, if you remember, one of the Hebrew words was uh, is Hallel, right? First year, it's it's all about celebrating, uh, raving about this God, and that's exactly what was happening. And I can't even begin to imagine uh, the party that must have been going on, right? Can you imagine just on the roads and the streets this kind of celebration that's happening? Um, before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir woods and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. The next verse is from First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4 and 6. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4 and 6. It says, um, 
uh, guys, just a quick question. Do you want me to share uh, my screen so that you can see the PDF? Or are you are you following along with me in uh, uh, in the notes? What do you prefer? OK. Okay. Cool. Uh, yes, Shri Kumar. Thank you, Pastor. I have a question. Can I ask now? Or? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I just want to know that um, uh, when, um, as you said right now, like um, you know, the Moses when uh, he built that um, uh, the tabernacle, it was it was mainly for um, the sacrifice, and uh, and I think so that um, even um, nowhere in the um, you know. According to Moses, there is no worship thing. Uh, I don't think so. It is mentioned there. But uh, when David started, as you said, it was actually he mixed it with the worship. So I just want to know that um, even the Moses said that nothing should be added in the law. So when most when David added it, this one thing, how um, how we can uh, you know um, how we can accept it because uh, it was not as per uh, my understanding. I'm not saying huh? that. So, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, as per Moses, it was only for the, it was a sacrificial thing. Yeah. But when, when David came and uh, he mixed with the worship, yeah. so, and it was not uh, prescribed in the, um, in the, in the, according to Moses. So how we can, uh, you know, understand this, this thing. Thank you, Pastor. Thank that's yeah, sure. Pastor. Thanks, uh, Shri Kumar. Yeah, I mean, so if you if we start drawing a comparison and parallelly between Moses' tabernacle and david's tabernacle uh the question would be how uh how is it possible what david did or anything what david did is possible right so one of the thing is now uh the law was different from the instruction that was given to build the tabernacle and what was supposed to happen in the tabernacle right and so uh just to answer your question directly uh, David was not adding anything to the law, all right? Uh, so he was just expressing, uh, see, priests were worshipping as well, but uh, they were offering sacrifices, and that is a form of worship. What David brought in was he added instruments and singing and songs. Now, in the time of Moses, there was singing, but it was just didn't happen in the tabernacle. So, uh, like you know, when they came out of Egypt after crossing the Red Sea, uh, we see that Miriam led them in the song, isn't it? Um, so singing was always there during the time of Moses. It was just not actively, uh, you know, followed in the tabernacle as part of the service per se. Uh, but, but then again, you can study about this and just completely sidetrack about drawing a parallel between Moses' tabernacle and David's tabernacle because David's tabernacle did not have uh, outer courts, inner courts, uh, the holy place. It was just one place, a tent of meeting, and and, uh, and people were all around it. There was no veil. Uh, the only explanation that I can give is David, although he was living in the old covenant, got a glimpse of God's grace of the new covenant. Uh, we we know David as a worshiper, as a king, and whatnot. But uh, we don't really. We should take time to learn about David as a as a prophet as well, because uh, the prophetic on him was was huge, uh, right? If you you'll know that when you read Psalm twenty two and uh, and whatnot, right? So that's my only explanation and understanding that living in the old covenant, he has this glimpse of God's grace of the new covenant. Ultimately, what matters to him is is obedience. Right? Because time and time again we see that uh, obedience goes, uh, obedience is what matters to God than the sacrifice in itself, and uh, that seemed to have pleased God, and that's my only explanation that I can give Sri Kumar because uh, I have asked the same question many times as in how is it possible when God very clearly told Moses that there needs to be a veil and and people have died uh, when they have not followed that instruction and then here David is uh, just doing everything that's almost opposite but then god is accepting that his offering um so i have asked that and i just a genuine question and 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 i've i've heard a lot of scholars historians uh, preachers teachers talk on the subject and they all seem to come to that same conclusion as that david 
kind of foresaw the new covenant and he lived in the old covenant as though he was living in the new covenant. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. So if you can just continue uh, from the second verse that was mentioned in the notes in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4 to 6 says of David, he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord, even to celebrate and to thank and praise God of Israel. So it's very important that he mentions that he appointed some of the Levites. Now, when he was bringing the ark back in 2 Samuel 6, uh, verse 5, and we know one tragic incident that happens. Um, Right, is that um, they placed the Ark of the Covenant on a, a cart while it was supposed to be carried by the Levites, isn't it? Uh, and somewhere uh, it is it is possible that David did not know about this thing because uh, I forget which chapter in the book of Deuteronomy. If you can give me just one moment, if I can find it. Um, So, uh, okay, I mean, maybe one of you can help me find it. But so what, what, what this verse says, and I'm paraphrasing it, it says, uh, the kings who, uh, in somewhere in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, oh, you you will ask for kings and when you when you choose your the you know a king for your uh, to lead you, the king is supposed to be surrounded by the priests and learn from the word instruction. So uh, and that was the instruction which was given to Moses and his people uh, by God way before Israel was even going to ask for a king. And that's, we see that for the first time in the book of Judges. And the instruction is when they find a king, when they choose a king, they're supposed to learn the word, the instructions from the priests around them. And uh, I paraphrase this whole thing, and I assure you it's in the Bible. Uh, and somewhere, David, I'm sure you know David missed that instruction, and you know, and that that tragic accident happens, and so what happens after that? He's, uh, oh yeah, thanks, yay, <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter seventeen. Okay, now that uh, the reference is given, uh, let's just quickly take a look at it. <clears throat> and it's a beautiful chapter um, from verse fourteen onwards. Um, can we read that? Is that okay? Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, verse 14. And I just want to read it for us. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like the, all the nations around us. This is God prophesying about what's going to happen. I don't know how, how many years, though. Is telling about the people in the book of Judges will are gonna ask, and that's what happens. Verse 15 says, Be sure to appoint over you the king, the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, no, uh, one who is not um, or not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back to that way again. Verse 17, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Verse 18, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from the taken from that of the priests who are levites it is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to rever the lord his god and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees Okay, so it was very important for the king uh, who was going to become the king to learn everything about God's word, about God's law. And this was given years before people of Israel would, you could even ask for a king, right? And so after the tragic incident, David goes back to the basics. 
he learns about this okay this was the instruction given by god levites are to carry and so long story short after many chapters when we come to first chronicles 16 we see that he appointed some of the levites that means he's learned from his mistakes and he's honoring god's word right he appointed some of the levites as ministers before the ark of the lord even to celebrate and to thank and praise the lord god of israel Asaph, the chief, and the second to him, Zechariah, then Jael, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Mataniah, Eliab, Benaniah, Obed, Edom, and Jael, with musical instruments, harps, lyres. Also, Asaph played loud sounding cymbals, and Benaniah and Jehaziel, the priest, blew trumpets continually before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Right. Uh, it's amazing to read these passages and to just imagine the passion that these people had uh, for God, isn't it? To worship him. I just reading them uh, just does something to me. Uh, on a side note, you see the name called Obed Edom, right? Um, if anytime you're bored and you don't know what to do, uh, read in the Bible, I would uh, encourage you to do a character study on Obed Edom. Uh, he is what I call, what I would call, uh, a minor character with a with a major impact. So, Obed-Edom is a good character study. Okay, let's move on. First Chronicles chapter twenty-five, verse one, uh, says: Moreover, David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and Jeduthun, who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals. Uh, remember this verse, guys. Uh, we're going to do an in-depth uh, study of First Chronicles chapter 25 itself, from verse one to verse seven in the in the later part uh, of this of the course. Okay, First Chronicles chapter 25, verse one. Okay, David and the commanders of the army set apart some of the service, some set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph and Heman and Jeruthun who were to prophesy with liars. So he set apart, and they were all Levites. Okay, Second uh, Chronicles chapter 5, verse 12 and 14. Uh, why don't someone else read this, okay, from your notes? Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. Can I request one of us to read, please? Shall I read first? <clears throat> yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 12 to 14 speaks of all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, Jed Jeduthun, and their sons and kinsmen, clothed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, standing east of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets in unison with the trumpeters and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and to glorify the Lord. When they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and when they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you. So very quickly, when we just read that verse, and I hope all of us followed along, uh, what from that verse stands out to you? Or should I ask Avni to read it again? Avni, do you mind reading it again for us? Sure, Pastor. All the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, Jeduthun, and their sons and kinsmen clothed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres standing east of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets in unison, when the trumpeters and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice 
to praise and to glorify the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and when they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Amen. 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 Okay. So thank you so much for being so kind uh, and reading it again. So guys, yeah, share what what stands out to you. you see Elisha sharing it in the chat. This is yeah, sure, Charles. Charles. Yes, Charles. Uh, when we worship God, His glory comes down. Yep. Thank you, Charles. What else? Uh, yeah, dear Pastor. Uh, for me. Um, it's actually uh, their unison where uh, one twenty plus people were there, but they are worshiping in unison, and uh, there is a particular system uh, in which they are doing. They are not um, doing according to their own will, but following the like uh, structure or kind of the system, and uh, uh, they were doing it with with their all hearts. They are not, you know. Um, or, or what we can say they are lacking themselves or they are hiding themselves from doing the worship ministry but they are doing it with their all their might and they are doing it uh, for the presence of God and when the presence of God glorified them and filled so they couldn't able to stand so that is the thing which stands out for me that they are doing it in unison and then they are doing it with all their might yeah Thank you, Prabhaka. Thank you so much yeah, for sharing that. Uh, and uh, yes, guys, uh, yeah, in one voice, although there is multiple voices and instrument. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. Encountering God's glory, yeah, one voice. Uh, yeah, God rest. Sure, 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 please. Uh, what, uh, what stood out for me was uh, they praised the God for who He is. They, mm. but together, uh, praising the Lord for who He is in one accord, in unity and love, uh, expressing their. Uh, uh, the revelation of uh, who God is, as yeah. they praise the Lord for being a magnificent, everlasting God, the glory filled the house. Yeah, Amen. That's such a lovely point, isn't it? Uh, God responded to the worship. Yes, Mangi, He did. Uh, and I just on the lines, you know, all they sang was, "He indeed is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting." I've never come across a one-line song <laughs> that uh, hit and uh you know but all they sang like like you said they worshiped him for who he is that's a lovely perspective right for they did not worship him for what they wanted so that they could have a miracle or a healing or something all of that is good and we should reach out to him for all of that yes but all they sang was that he is good and his loving kindness endures forever right and I just I, I love the progression of this verse, right? Uh, the way it starts. I mean, the, the way the narrative is built. It says the Levitical singers. It's very precise, right? Uh, detail. Levitical. It's not just one any tribe singers. It's Levitical singers. The names mentioned: Asaph, Heman, their family, and their relatives, kinsmen. And then it goes on to say what they were wearing, clothed in fine linen. I'm I. You know, when details like that are mentioned, I ask, why is details like that mentioned? You know, but must be very important, right? Clothed in fine linen, they present before God. And then the instruments, right? Uh, that they were set, And standing east of the altar. Uh, standing east of the altar. Uh, when we read about, when we study a little bit about the tabernacle of Moses, we see that the gate uh, of the, for the tabernacle, right? Uh, the outer court gate was facing east. Um, and with them, 120 priests blowing trumpets in unison. Now, guys, uh, I've had the privilege to study music, okay, and uh, also did a little bit of orchestration. If you've seen uh, 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 an orchestra, right, uh, you've seen a guy with doing, you know, the conductor, and then 140 piece. Uh, orchestra right so that 140 you can go up to 150 140 piece orchestra 
so in that orchestra you have the strings section right in the front you have the violinist you have the second violinist you have the violas and you have the cello section and one with the double bass so that's the strings section of the orchestra then you have the percussion section at the back like the drums and the timpanis and the triangles uh, all the percussive instruments, right? Um, and the piano is also a part of it. Um, and then there's the woodwind section with the flutes and uh, all the different kinds of uh, woodwinds with the oboe and clarinet and whatnot. And then there's the brass section, okay? In the brass section, you have the trumpet, you have the trombones, you know, you've seen an instrument, they pull it like this in the front and blow into it, yeah? Trombone, uh, they have the French horn, the one that's circled like a, and you know French horn and the tuba the big thing that put around inside them and the, the brass section in the brass section they would maximum have only mm, three of tops four trumpets just three of out of a hundred and forty piece orchestra people uh, they would have a maximum of about say three or four trumpet because trumpets are very very loud okay you will see the conductor standing in front of the orchestra always you know controlling them it's like okay you know control your volume even though if you have to play loud just watch yourself watch yourself because it can easily overpower the entire orchestra that's just three or four guys how many do we have here <laughs> A hundred and twenty. I can't imagine. I don't think I can imagine. One, I'm it must have been loud, it must have been very loud. Um, but it must have been great as well. <laughs> right? An entire nation would have been able to hear these people praising him. Uh, right, it's just mind blowing. And if you're not overwhelmed by the thought, uh, sorry, and they were blowing in unison just to make it more. Hmm. You know, when the trumpeters and singers were to make themselves heard with one voice, unity is so important in the kingdom of God, isn't it? Something about unity. When we read uh, in Acts chapter 1 and 2, on the day of Pentecost, it says they were all gathered together in one heart, in one accord in unity and then he shows up right uh, something about unity something about one voice uh coming before our god and lifting up praise and worship and then as they did that god shows up right he fills the temple uh, with his cloud with his manifest presence for the glory of the lord filled the house of god um our, our worship in our churches uh, should be doing this as we are to encourage our teams, our congregations to come together in one accord, in, in unison, in one heart, uh, and then worship him extravagantly, like Elisha is saying, right? a very extravagant worship. What a beautiful word. Thanks, Elisha. Right? We're just holding nothing back no sh shifting gears slowly gear one gear two gear three you know gear 10 from the beginning from the word go uh it doesn't it doesn't look like they had a fast song to start and then go into a slow song and then you know get into the feels of it and whatnot no these guys are sending it from just the word go right uh you guys with me okay all right let's um uh, let's move on now we go to the next uh, verse, um, it's 25 to 30. Can I request uh, another person to read it, please? Second Chronicles 29, 25 to 30. It's in the notes, by the way. Okay, I'll read it for us. Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25 to 30. Uh, it's in your notes, page, 20, uh, page 9. It's, it speaks, this section speaks of the worship to God instigated by Hezekiah, right? So this is what it says. He, 
Hezekiah then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps, and with lyres, according to the command of David and of Gad, the king's seer. Okay, so that means David had set a standard. He had set a for, set of instruction. He then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps, and with lyres, according to the command of David and Gad, the king's seer and of Nathan the prophet, for the command was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the musical instruments of David. Okay, do you notice that? The Levites stood with the musical instruments of David. That means David designed and built certain instruments. Amazing, isn't it? So the Levites stood with musical instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah gave the order to offer the burnt offerings on the altar. When the burnt offering began, the song to the Lord also began with the assembly. Oh, sorry, but began with the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. While the whole assembly worshipped, the singers also sang and the trumpets sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Now, at the completion of the burnt offerings, the king and all who were present with him bowed down and worshipped. Moreover, King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to sing praise to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with joy and bowed down and worshipped. Okay, so talk to me. What stands out to you in that verse, in that portion of scriptures? Hello, uh, Pastor, can I speak? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, what stands out to me is the posture of the worshippers. They were constantly bowing down. That is, they were humbling themselves before the King of Kings in their worship. Thank you. Thanks, Elisha. Anyone else, feel free to unmute and uh, share. Charles, Christopher, yeah, Mangi, go ahead. I think uh, first thing I see it's is order. Um, they didn't start worshiping, no, uh, making sacrifice until the king's king uh, Hezekiah gave order, and then the musician played in order. So according to what they planned, so they didn't. There wasn't chaos. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what I was going for. Okay, thanks for sharing that. What else? Come on, speak to me. Can I say something also? Yeah, go ahead. This is Charles. Um, you see, as they are shipping, they, they, they are, there is already a culture. There is already a culture that they are following. They are not doing their own things, but there is something that had been said maybe in the old, old worship, then the David is one, now they are bringing in, the, everything is based on order and culture. Um, I don't know whether it's the right word to use, but I am use, I'm seeing the word culture, like the order of service, like the order of worship, but they are following a certain um, system, a certain order. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Yes. Yeah, there was order, uh, like as Mangi shared, there's order creates culture. Yeah, that means they already had, because there was order, a culture was created. And because there's culture, they're following the order. So it's complementing each other, isn't it? Um, so that's wonderful. Yeah. Obedience and leadership. Yeah. 
obedience and leadership and obedience to leadership as well is another uh, thing isn't it that's yeah anything else oh uh, yes uh, pastor i think uh, i see that there is there seems to be some link between you know the start of um, the you know the burnt offering on the altar and uh, you know and the singing so i don't know whether that is a very um, uh, you know um, a sacred moment a very um, i mean a moment where you know the people are in this this uh, like people in that in that uh, group of musicians are um, uh, you know filled with you know that that level of, of worship that you know probably yes. transcends everything else uh, you know yeah. so uh, maybe there's you know that closeness also to god uh, at that stage so this yeah. is something that i just sort of uh, uh, you know uh, got from this uh, this verse thanks christopher thank you for sharing evany please go ahead yeah okay just thinking uh, pastor that these people were there uh, right there not with any kind of practice i believe before and they're just worshiping in one accord with the power of the holy spirit and it, there is unity there is flow there is rhythm there is you know everything is perfect yeah. without any kind of practice i don't think they were practicing before for that probably that's not yeah Andrew. Yeah, so um, when when we go back to uh, First Chronicles, First Chronicles twenty five, uh, when we go through that, and uh, the first seven verses at least, it says, uh, so they were skilled musicians, um, and they also had a lot, like a roster, as in who will be serving twenty four hours around the clock, because the Tabernacle of David was happening twenty four hours a day. Right? It was around the clock. We'll re we'll get we'll read more about that. So, um, but. But that's the thing. So there was order there were, and the culture was created and everybody were expected to be skilled in what they did. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that uh, that was happening. There. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Prabhakar, please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, for me, a uh, few points have been stand up as uh, I had been reading. First, uh, as the Levites were stationed in the house of God, uh, which was the commandment of uh, you know from the god through his prophets so they are following the commandment second thing stood out for me was the uh, system i mean the structure or the order we can say uh, according to which they were stationed and everyone know what they have to do and yep. they are doing it in order not according to their will or not according to their you know thought process but they are following the instructions in order from the god and even from the prophets yep. third thing stood out for me was uh like everyone was ready with their you know uh trumpets and 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 all the instruments and then the the king hezekiah you know uh, gave the order to uh, offer the burn offering and as soon as the uh, burn offering process has begun everyone started uh doing their work like the singers were singing the the, the musicians were you know uh you're uh, playing the music instruments and and the most important thing why was, was the whole assembly worship, even the people who were studying out there, apart from the singers or the musicians, the whole assembly, you know, uh, involved in worshiping law with yeah. all their hearts until uh, the offering was finished, until they didn't stop in the meanwhile or in the midst, but they have waited uh, for the offering to finish. And uh, even after the offering was completed, everyone, uh, including the king, everyone bowed on and worshiped. Uh, uh, so, uh, thinking that the God has uh, accepted the burnt offering and even uh, started praises with joy and bow down and worship. So this worship process uh, started before the burnt offering, during the burnt offering, and even after the burnt offering. That believing that God has accepted uh, their burnt offering and they did with all the joy and uh, they didn't hold back their emotions. They did it with all joys, all might. So these are the few points that stood out for me, Pastor. Thank you. Thanks, Prabhupada. Yeah, thanks for sharing that extensively. Uh, yeah, so that's one of the things that stood out for me, guys. Is yes, there is order and there's this culture, and I can think, I can, I can think of a lot of churches that have order in, in you know, in the present day. But just looking at the passion that these people had, uh, as in there is zeal, there is zeal for God. Uh, 
I don't like the word passion, but their zeal for God, right? They, and how much they were on fire for him, that they were filled with, with love and adoration and affection, that they worshipped him. And like you mentioned, right, until the burnt offering was finished. Now, we don't know for how long or how many hours that, you know, it took for the burnt offering to be, you know, uh, completely burnt out. You know? uh, and even after that, they continued to worship. Isn't isn't that amazing? And sometimes you know, if if we sing, if if we sing one song for more than five minutes, we start looking at our watches like, okay, hey, how many times are you singing this chorus? Let's get a move on, okay? Uh, Twelve thirty, ding ding ding, okay, service time up. We gotta move on. I have to go home, have lunch. <laughs> uh, looks like these people just wanted to be in the house of God, right? So there was order, there was culture, there was just zealous. Uh, for, uh, they were zealous for more of God. Um, so those are the things that's kind of stood out, and I hope that we can take something away from those, um, from these ver verses. Okay, so uh, we'll stop here, this section, and uh, we'll take a quick break, and we'll come back into the second section. Okay? All right. Stop the recording now. <laughs> 